Welcome to the Immunization Pathway Training. My name is Mike Gittleman. I am an emergency room physician at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and I'm also the president-elect for the Ohio chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. My, the other speaker today is uh, Beth Barker. She is the nurse educator for the Ohio chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Neither one of us have anything to disclose for this talk. So at the end of the talk today, we're really hoping that you'll understand why immunizations are important to preventing disease and to decrease the morbidity and mortality uh, for children, to identify and understand the most common myths and misconceptions about immunizations, and then hopefully provide you with some resources to educate your clients and families. Um, many of you have taken the pre-test already, and we're hoping that at the end of this talk, you'll have learned uh, all of the answers so that when you take the post-test, you will be able to get everything right. So first, what are immunizations and why are they important? So a vaccine is a strain of the virus along with some preservatives. So they were first discovered uh, in the 1890s by Edward Jenner when he was finding a way to uh, find a cure for smallpox. He was noticing that um, parts of cow um, blood was able to be used to affect against cowpox. And so by getting a strain of the virus, was a way to be able to um, prevent future illness. So there are actually three types of vaccines that we have today. So we have live attenuated vaccines, and these are weak forms of the germ. Uh, because they're weak forms of the germ, uh, patients only need a few doses, and they can actually have lifelong immunity. And so immunizations that have are live attenuated are like measles, mumps, rubella, and the oral polio. Another type is inactivated viruses. So these are dead or part of the germ is introduced um, to the patient. And they need several doses in order to get immunity. And these types are like flu, hepatitis A and B, pertussis, and the inactivated polio. And then lastly, we can give a toxoid, which is a vaccine against the toxin that the germ produces. Those vaccines are like diphtheria and tetanus. And these vaccines are incredibly effective if given in the appropriate schedule. If you can imagine in the 1890s, many families would have seven or eight children and they'd recognize that only maybe half of them would survive because they'd be suffering from many of these illnesses. These vaccines have really decreased that morbidity and mortality and have made it so that every child survives and they don't suffer from these um, illnesses. Well, so how do these vaccines work? So as we said that we introduce a small portion of the virus to the um, patient and then they develop an immunity to be able to fight this um, infection later on. So what the vaccines do is they help their body fight disease by imitating this infection. And in return, what the body does is it develops a defense against the infection, typically without ever having any symptoms of the disease. Um, as you see, this is starred, so this will be one of the uh, post-test uh, questions. And if the body encounters the infection after being uh, vaccinated, it fights this disease, so they never actually have any of the symptoms of it whatsoever. So why would you give vaccines to children at such a young age? Well, when children are very young, their immune system has not really even seen many of these different germs. And so as a result, their body, the earlier you can introduce it, the earlier they can fight infections. So if they receive it at an early schedule, they're protected to ever coming in contact with this disease as well as these young children can have significant problems if they suffer from these diseases. So for example, if a child gets pertussis and they're under six months of age, they have a, a very um, 
uh, significant risk of having apnea and stop breathing. So if we can immunize these children early on so that they've seen parts of this virus, they will not be um, affected even at very young ages. Another question that we get is, well, who decides on the vaccine schedule? Well, the vaccine schedule comes out, and there's actually a, a reason why kids get them not only at a young age, but in the schedule that they do. So top experts around the country, they work together and they review decades of data to determine the vaccine schedule. And then once they come out with it to look at, well, how rapidly your immune system can respond, how often you need to actually get a repeat dose so that your immune system can be ramped up to fight this infection, this gets approved by many organizations. A few of these organizations are the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the American Academy of Family Physicians. Immunizations don't only protect you as an individual or your child, they actually protect all of the people in the community. So when enough people are immunized against a contagious disease, those in your community that cannot receive it can also be protected. It takes about 90% of children to be able to reach herd immunity. So that would say if a, a child um, has leukemia and is on chemotherapy, they're not able to get a vaccine because they can't actually fight against some of the viruses that the live um, uh, virus vaccine would have. So as a result, if more than 90% of the people in their community are vaccinated, then it would protect those that are unable to be vaccinated. So it's really important that we emphasize everyone in your community to be vaccinated because we want to make sure even those that aren't able to be vaccinated can be protected. And as I mentioned, not everyone can get vaccines. So some people are not able to get it. And those people would include anyone with a life-threatening allergy to a component of the vaccine, or if they're receiving chemotherapy, they can't get these live attenuated virus vaccines. Now, you always want to make sure you check with your doctor to make sure that your child is capable to get the immunization. However, that is the main reason we have children in our communities that have these allergies or that are on chemotherapy that can't get it. The more people that say, I just don't want my child to have a vaccine, it reduces the immunization rates. And if it's less than 90%, then those in the community that could be protected will not be. And as I mentioned, vaccines really do save lives. When um, I was a resident, we used to see a lot of these virus, meningococcemia, we would see haemophilus influenza, we would see a measles outbreak, uh, mumps, and so we've really eradicated many of these viruses today, and so we don't see them as commonly as we did in the past. So over the last 20 years, vaccines alone have prevented 322 million illnesses, such as measles, mumps, polio, meningitis. They've prevented 21 million hospitalizations, uh, 732,000 deaths, and it saved our economy 295 billion in just direct costs alone. These vaccines increase our life expectancy and they really are effective to decrease morbidity and mortality. You know, um, if you look at causes of death, um, the percentages, the causes of death have increased to, due to injuries, mainly because we've actually been finding that these vaccines are preventing many of these illnesses that killed our children in the early 40s, 50s, all the way to the 80s. Now, despite the that we have vaccines, we still see outbreaks of these viruses. Many families say, I've never even heard of mumps. My child wouldn't get it. Why should I worry about vaccinating them? Well, even recently, Ohio's had recent outbreaks of several vaccines that were preventable if the majority of our communities um, had vaccinated children. We've had measles outbreaks, we've had mumps outbreaks, we've even had whooping cough or pertussis outbreaks. 
So just as recently as 2014, um, in March, we had an unvaccinated Amish um, uh, community and uh, travelers that went to the Philippines. There were about 382 cases with 195 cases in Knox County of Ohio alone. They ranged anywhere from six months to 53 years of age. Nine of these um, patients were hospitalized. And health officials found that uh, these uh, individuals were not immunized and had not received these vaccines. And the reason why is they lacked the basic knowledge of the need for vaccines and the risks for not getting vaccines. So part of this education today is to educate you so when you go out into the homes and you're talking to families and they trust you, you can actually say, look, these vaccines make a difference. And if you and many in your community aren't going to get it, not only are those that are immunocompromised or have allergies at risk, but all of those other kids that might not even know about vaccines are at risk. And it's really important that they get vaccinated. We've also had a mumps outbreak. So as recently as January of 2014, there are 482 cases with 403 cases in Franklin County alone. As you can see that most of those were on the Ohio State University campus. And so these ranged from th six months of old to 80 years of old. Um, few of these patients were hospitalized because this illness um, doesn't cause significant um, morbidity or death. However, it does cause illness, and many of these patients lost many days of school or work, and this was completely preventable if every one of them were up to date on their vaccinations. And lastly, in 2016-2017 season alone, influenza um, affected 77 children and caused deaths. Five children died in Ohio alone. And whooping cough, there were close to 20,000 cases in the United States in 2015 and 827 cases in Ohio alone. There were three deaths in 2015. All were babies under one. As I had mentioned to you, the younger children have a greater risk of dying when they suffer from the whooping cough. So again, the reason why we want to stay on the schedule and immunize them at the appropriate intervals. So another question that we get is, well, are these vaccines safe? Well, although many of you might be hearing about vaccines today, these vaccines have been tested for many years. So if you take a look, data shows the current U.S. vaccine supply is the safest in all of history. The U.S. vaccine safety system ensures that vaccines are continually monitored, and um, if there are any issues, they are reported. And the FDA governs this whole process. So this isn't just some drug companies that want to actually um, make money because really the FDA makes sure that all of the testing is done before it even gets close to any of the patients. So let's talk a little bit about the journey of um, how a vaccine becomes approved. So before a new vaccine is ever given to people, they do extensive lab testing. And this lab testing, it could take several years. On average, it takes about 15 years. So this company might come up with this vaccine, and then it gets tested for 15 years before ever going to population. So it's not like there are delayed effects. Over those 15 years, they are monitoring everyone that's gotten it. And it also takes close to three phases of human trials are conducted. So they'll test this on humans way before it ever goes to the public. So it's not like the public, when they see this vaccine that comes out, this is new and they're getting tested upon. This has been tested way earlier before it even comes to you. And then once tested on these volunteers, it can even take several more years before it goes to clinical studies and that it becomes licensed to go to the general public. And then even after it goes out to the general public, they are continued to be monitored. So after it's licensed, they actually have lot numbers. If there's ever a problem, those lot numbers get reported so they can see, is this a problem with the vaccine? Is this a problem with that individual batch? And then each lot is tested to ensure safety, purity, and potency. So before it even goes to your doctor's office, they make sure that the vaccine and that lot is as safe as possible. So again, this is 
tested and tested and tested. These vaccines are incredibly safe. The intervals that they're given have been recommended and have been tested and overseen by a very strenuous process. So when families come out, and Beth's later on going to talk to you about more of the myths, but when families come out and they say, well, I know someone and this happened to them, that is probably not causally related. That something happened and it was in relation to them getting the vaccine, but these vaccines have been tested so much that there are not significant problems that are occurring with the vaccines themselves. So these vaccines are incredibly effective too. Whenever you think about, well, should my child get a vaccine, you have to look at the cost versus benefit to the family, right? So no vaccine is 100% effective. But if you take a look at the MMR vaccine, just after two doses, it's 90%, 97% effective. The varicella chickenpox vaccine, after two doses, it's 98% effective. So the risk of damage to your body is almost nil. You might have, and Beth's going to talk more about this, but you might have redness or soreness at the site. But you are then on the back end, 97% effective preventing them from getting a disease that could cause life-changing effects to them. Now, when you take a look at the flu vaccine, the flu vaccine, the way that they make that up is they take the three most common strains that they think that could be in, um, uh, in the United States, and they give you those viruses of those vaccines. That's why it's only about 50 to 60% effective. But again, when you look at the cost versus benefit, there were 77 deaths in the United States just last year. Well, those would be completely prevented if you got the vaccine. So when you start thinking about the benefit of these vaccines, far outweighs any type of risk. Now, the last thing I want to address with you is immunizations for uh, pregnant women. I know many of uh, you um, that are child health workers that are working with families, you deal with pregnant women when you're going into the home. So we thought we'd address immunizations when you're talking to um, women that are pregnant that you're caring for. So vaccines, as we talked about, there are the live attenuated, there are the toxoid. Um, each one of these has different safety, as we, rec as we discussed earlier. Some vaccines are safe and recommended for pregnant women, uh, and they can protect uh, transfer to the baby. So, for example, Tdap, tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, and, uh, is able to be given when the woman is pregnant. Also, a flu shot may be given during any trimester of their pregnancy. And family and caregivers who will be around a baby should also be vaccinated to protect the newborn child. So as we mentioned, these newborns have not seen many of these germs and viruses. And as a result, it's really important that they get vaccinated so, or others around them get vaccinated so that they can protect the children as well. So the other thing that you could do is talk to families that you're caring for and say, look, your child is going to get immunizations, and I want to be able to address that with you. So moms, be they might be nervous about their child receiving shots. One thing that we commonly hear is, well, my child's going to get all those shots at one time. Well, if you think about it, they're only being exposed to maybe four or five germs. Just a child being in the house, touching the countertop, there's thousands of germs that they're exposed to on a daily basis. So they are not getting exposed to too many germs at one time that it's really important for them to get these vaccines on the schedule that's recommended. But it's important that you start to address that with the moms when they're pregnant. And be understanding of any of their concerns, but assure them that these vaccines are incredibly safe and you might even give them the easy to read schedule so that when they go to their physician's office, they're already prepared, and they know that their child's going to be getting some vaccines. The other thing that you could talk to them about is that their child, um, before they leave the nursery, is actually going to get a vaccine, which is the hepatitis B vaccine. Uh, hepatitis is a serious liver disease, and it's caused by the hepatitis virus. Uh, babies can get the virus from their infected mothers at birth. And the birth dose of the hepatitis B vaccine is recommended within 24 hours of birth. 
it's safe for newborns, and it's important that they get it very early on. So as I mentioned, uh, Beth is going to be talking more about some of the other resources that we're going to be providing for you to be able to talk to your families. But one of the resources is a pregnant woman handout. And this handout, what it does is it talks about vaccines and how they can protect the mother as well as the baby. It talks about the different vaccines that are appropriate if you are pregnant. And it also talks about how it protects the baby. Um, I'm going to now turn this over to uh, Beth Barker. And what she's going to address is she's going to address how you determine if a uh, child is up to date on their vaccines with a resource that we are going to providing. Um, she's also going to talk about some of the myths that many of the misconceptions that you might hear families talk about. It's really important that you know how to address them. And then lastly, she's going to provide you with all of the resources that we will be giving you so that you have them in your back pocket. Whenever a family has some concerns or questions, it gives you all of the ammunition that you need to be able to talk to the families. So I'm going to turn it over to Beth to um, uh, keep giving you some more education. Thank you. Hello, I'm Beth Barker. I am the nurse educator for the Ohio Chapter American Academy of Pediatrics. So I'm moving on to how do you know if a child is up to date on vaccines? So the first slide I have here is what the CDC has designed and calls their 2017 recommended immunizations for children from birth through six years old. But really in all actuality, this is what they call their easy to read schedule. Um, so if you look, take a look here, you can definitely see that the age of the child is at the top and the vaccine abbreviations are below. So if I was a parent, I could identify that my child is six months of age and below that block are the indications for the vaccines that should be given at that time period. In addition to that, anything before six months of age, my child should have already received. Additionally, on the back, um, probably the more interesting part of it is a listing of the vaccine preventable diseases and the vaccines that we use to prevent them. So what this does is it delineates the disease, the vaccine that prevents these diseases. It tells you how the disease is spread. So for example, the first one is chickenpox and it's spread through the air or direct contact. It also shows you disease symptoms and any complications that may arise. So if I was a parent, I could learn and say, hey, uh, my child has these symptoms and here are some complications that could or may occur if my child were to get this disease. So very helpful in understanding how the disease works, how it's spread and why we're vaccinating. It's not just because of the disease itself, it is also because of potential risky complications for the child or adolescent. You will see many different kinds, many different versions of uh, immunization record. And frankly, just call it a vaccine record. Most of the time, if you have a paper version, it will say vaccine record. You could have a family written record. Uh, if you remember, uh, depending upon your age, uh, there were yellow cards that were handed out, and that is handwritten information on there about vaccines that, that children may receive. There is a online system called Impact Sys. That is a statewide system that is a repository of all administered vaccines. Now, don't get me wrong, every vaccine that a child gets may not be on here. In fact, the child may not even be on this registry. However, it is available and you can print that out if that child is on the registry. Um, electronic registry printout simply means a direct report from a patient's a physician's office. So they can print those directly from their electronic health record. Health department records may vary in how they look. And vaccines may be listed by disease name, generic name, trade name, or abbreviation. For example, pertussis is the disease. DTAP is the generic name of the vaccine, and that stands for diphtheria, tetanus, and acellular pertussis. Or Infinrix, which is actually a trade name of a product available, and that is a DTAP, T, DTAP vaccine but the trade name is Infinrix. So 
All of these are one and the same. They just may appear differently to you on a record. Additionally, meningococcal is the disease. The MCV4 is the vaccine, but it's the generic term. And MenVO is actually a trade name of a product available that does prevent meningococcal disease. There are some commonly missed vaccinations for preschoolers. Please note the red little star there. This is important information. Um, so the DTAP fourth dose, which is, as I said, the diphtheria, tetanus, and acellular pertussis vaccine, that is typically due between 15 and 18 months old. So this one tends to be one that is missed. Um, it is essential for continued protection, especially from pertussis. And what is pertussis? It's whooping cough. And some people may call it whooping cough. Um, so that is what we're protecting these children against. For teens, there's also a commonly missed vaccine, and that is the human papillomavirus, or HPV vaccination. Uh, take note of this red star again. This is important information for you. 41.9% uh, of girls received all three shots, and 28.1% of boys received all three shots. That is based on the 2015 National Immunization Survey numbers, and that is um, strictly for the state of Ohio. So in all actuality, the number that we're trying to get to based on Healthy People 2020 goals, and that was goals set by federal standards, is 80% across the board. So as you can see, we're, we're well away from that 80% goal. This vaccine actually prevents 200 plus types of cancers in boys and girls. Okay, so side effects. Now, there is a difference between a side effect and an adverse reaction. So typical, we are giving an injection, so there may be some fever, fussiness, redness at the injection site, perhaps a lump at the injection site, or a little bit of swelling. These are common. Now, the difference is a severe reaction or adverse reaction would be anaphylaxis. That is actually a shortness of breathing. If you know somebody who has a peanut allergy, um, who is severely allergic to peanuts, they can go into anaphylactic shock, meaning that their throats begins to close up and they cannot breathe. So this is a severe reaction. That's what it's talking about. Seizure activity or encephalitis. And encephalitis is swelling on the brain. So that would be a true indication of a severe reaction. A little bit of redness and tenderness at the injection site or local reaction is not an adverse event. Uh, inactivated mount a response immediately. And what that means is inactivated vaccinations um, mount a response immediately in the child or adolescent. So you can have a fever within the first 24 hours. Live vaccines have a delayed immune response, meaning a rash may develop, but most likely not within a 24-hour period. Um, if the child has a fever for more than 72 hours after the injection, you want to see your doctor. So we always recommend that. Make sure that you contact your physician for further instruction. Um, he, may, he or she may need to see you back in the office. So why are people still concerned about vaccines? So myth, vaccines are not safe. This is not true. In all actuality, vaccines are extremely safe. They do not cause the illness. They go through years of study and trials before ever being licensed to the public. The FDA in the United States is probably one of the strongest systems of protection for citizens of the U.S. And that goes along with vaccines and, and other products. You know, they're testing multiple things, food products. Um, you know, they're, they're testing things for safety to the public. So vaccinations do not get on the market willy-nilly. They go through a, a stringent testing. And most vaccines are not available to the public um, until after about 15 years of testing and, and showing results that are helpful and not harmful. Another myth, the diseases are not a big deal. Well, that's not true. 
The fact is that the diseases continue to spread in Ohio and the U.S. Whooping cough, for example, and measles, those are extremely contagious, meaning you come into contact with somebody and you are not immune to these, you are more than likely to actually come down with the actual illness. That can cause serious injury, permanent damage, or death. All right, I've heard this one. Vaccines overload a child's immune system. Not true. And there's that little red star again, so make sure you're listening. Vaccines work with the body's immune system to build protection against a disease if they're ever exposed. Um, in all actuality, there are less antigens in the vaccines today than there were in the 1960s. Uh, meaning, on average, if you get all of the vaccines recommended by the ACIP by the time you're two years of age, you may be introduced to somewhere between, you know, 100 to 150 antigens. Back in the 60s, there were only three vaccinations on the schedule, and of those, uh, those vaccinations, you were introduced to about 3,200 ant antigens. So that just kind of goes to show you we have come a long way in the science of building vaccination and making it safer and better. Uh, additionally, think about what children put in their mouths, cell phones, um, you know, they are coming into contact with, with thousands, hundreds of thousands of germs a day. So these antigens cannot be controlled, whereas we are controlling what is in a vaccination. Um, so it is not overloading their immune system. Next one is giving too many shots too soon is bad for a child. Well, children are exposed to thousands of germs daily. I think I just hit on this. Five to eight in a vaccine is not a significant number. Um, also, children mount a better immune response than older people do. So that's something to keep in mind. The younger we are, the better we are able to mount that immune response, which is, as you can see from the schedules, why you receive the majority of your vaccinations in, in uh, infancy and adolescence, and not so much when we get older. If a child has a cold, you shouldn't vaccinate. This is not true. So the fact is that even if a child has a minor illness, they can still receive vaccines. It is important to receive them in a timely manner. And the reason is, is we want to decrease the possibility of this disease becoming, coming back, resurging. Um, so we wanna make sure that they get them at these appropriate timeframes. Well, my child only needs the important vaccines. Okay, so this is another myth. Some patients and parents are looking at important vaccines, but really the recommended schedule are all the important vaccines. It is carefully planned to protect babies and children early in life um, when they are most vulnerable and before they are exposed. So the idea behind this is we wanna protect them before they get exposed to these life-threatening diseases. If you delay or, or refuse certain vaccines, essentially you're just putting the child at risk for serious illness or death. So while we can sympathize with you know patients who, who want to do the best thing for their for their patient uh, for their client for their their children, um, the idea of delaying or refusing vaccines um, only increases the chances of of this illness taking hold. All right, this is a big one. Vaccines cause autism. This is incorrect. More than 200 studies, well-designed studies, by the way, have found no link between vaccines and autism. This debate came out in the late 90s, um, and I will just kind of hint around here to, it was a, a physician at that time named Andrew Wakefield. Mr. Wakefield is no longer a physician. Um, much of his results were falsified. Uh, so he actually had his medical license removed. Um, so this is not a basis of, of actual truth. Um, however, we're still talking about it. So just think about, you know, fear really motivates and you want to do what's best for your child. I, I understand that. But vaccines do not cause autism. Um, so just want to be clear about that message. 
So we are providing you with this myth fact sheet that you can provide to your clients. All of these myths are here along with the answers that I have cited. Um, so hopefully this can be a source of information for you and for your clients and families that you serve. So when you talk to families, how do you talk to them about vaccines? So talking to family about vaccines, make sure you take note, there's a red star here. Make sure you are firm in recommending the vaccination. Listen and be understanding about their concerns. So take the time, let them voice what their concerns are and, and just be there as a listening ear. Acknowledge that vaccines carry a small risk, but the risk of these diseases are far greater. So vaccination would not be a recommendation if the vaccine was a greater risk than the disease. It is not. The disease carries a much greater risk than the actual vaccination. And then provide educational pamphlets, which we have for you, but it really does give them an opportunity to review these things, take it to their physician or their pediatrician or family practice, and, and get some questions answered. So do not try to answer questions if you don't feel comfortable answering them. Um, we don't want you to feel uncomfortable. Uh, if it's something that you're not comfortable with answering, direct them to their family physician, their pediatrician, wherever they're receiving their care, um, and make sure that, that that is followed up on, that they can get that answer. Make sure they've made that appointment and follow up with this patient and parent or whoever your client is. Um, and make sure that those questions have been answered. We are providing some resources to you. So three tips for talking to parents is our first tip sheet. And these resources are will be available to you. Um, so I've already said, make sure you're firm in your recommendation of vaccines. Listen and be understanding about their concerns. And provide resources and links to trusted organizations for them to get more information. And we're going to have those additional links available to you as well. These pamphlets are really great ways to kind of dispel some of the myths that parents may have. So the first pamphlet is green. Um, and it says, your child thanks you. So this is for parents who are fully vaccinating according to ACIP recommendations. And we want to thank them for making this decision, not only for protecting their own child, but for protecting children and adolescents and even the elderly um, who, who may not be able to receive certain vaccinations. The middle one is yellow, so it's why risk it? So these are for those parents or clients of yours that are hesitant about vaccines or perhaps are thinking they want to delay some or have a delayed schedule in mind. So this lists out some myths and facts about why that's not such a good idea. And then the last one is a red pamphlet called What is Your Reason? So this one really focuses in on those true um, non-vaccinators, the ones that say, I absolutely will not vaccinate my child. And, and how that will affect things moving forward. It gives them information. It talks about myths that they may believe to be factual and, and the actual factual answers to those myths. Um, so hopefully if you do have somebody that is a true anti-vaxxer or, or will not vaccinate, this can be a pamphlet that you can utilize to provide them more information. We also have a couple of teen vaccine pamphlets. The first one is the young man on your left. It says immunization is the best protection. This resource will also be available to you. And it really does go over what vaccinations that teen need, teens need at different time frames. So 11 and 12 year olds need their Tdap, meningococcal, ACWY vaccine, and the HPV vaccine. It also has information about the flu vaccine, if it's that time of year. It has information about the meningococcal B vaccination. Um, so there's a lot of good information in here so that this client of yours knows what is coming up for their child or if they are of this appropriate age range that they are due for some vaccinations. The pamphlet on the right says, did you know? 
This pamphlet is specific to the HPV vaccination, and it lists some factual information. It provides additional uh, information on where to go for, for um, factual information on HPV with trusted sources. Um, so there's a lot of good information specifically around the human papillomavirus vaccine or HPV vaccine. Additionally, we are offering a uh, mobile app, um, and it's called Fast Vax Facts. So um, the mobile app was created in June of 2016. This is free. So it's a free download from, you know, the Apple Store or um, Google Play for Android. And it's you can use it. Your clients can use it. It's updated regularly. And re it also includes... Um, you know, if you get push notifications or things like that with other apps, if there was a reminder that you need to come in for something or that your child does, or there's an outbreak in your area, these are the types of things that it will alert you to. So there's a provider side to this. So provider meaning physician, uh, advanced practice nurse, somebody who's providing care. Um, and this provider side has Mobi Travels, um, Parental Vax Concerns, Earn MOC and CME Credit, and fa Vax Fax On The Go. Um, so really this is directed toward the provider, some things that they might need. It has searchable facts on vaccines. Um, it, you have the ability to email your, your patient um, or parent directly with VIS sheets or any additional information. It's really a nice way for them to kind of interact um, through media, through an app. There's also the parent login side, which will be mostly what you're going to be looking at. Um, there's the immunization schedule. Uh, there's searchable facts on vaccines. So if I typed in HPV, I'm going to get most common questions that people may have around the HPV vaccine. There's a list of trusted media. Not every bit of information on the internet is created equal. Um, so this really it takes them to places where this, this information is vetted um, and that people uh, can go there and learn more. There are also videos from pediatricians from Ohio discussing the need for vaccination, answering some common questions or, or re, uh, rebutting on some common myths about vaccines. Um, so this is a really excellent way. Um, parents can also keep track of their child's vaccines in this app. Um, this is all HIPAA compliant. We don't keep any of that information. They simply um, can go in, put their child's first name and date of birth, and they can go in and say, well, today um, my child got the Tdap vaccine and simply touch it and it lists the date and the time that the, their child received the vaccine. And it's a nice way for them to have that information. So we, you know, using this with your clients, it's great if you guys can take a look at it and see how it works, use it on your own. You can download it on the tablets that you utilize. Um, the first thing I would say is choose the it's okay to ask function um, under uh, the uh, patient login area. And it's really going to go through some common questions. If they have a question about a specific vaccine, type in, you know, autism. And you are going to find uh, a lot of information about the, the autism issue um, and, and the fact that autism is not caused by vaccines. Um, so make sure you're typing in keywords and it can answer some of those common concerns. Show them the trusted media section. So as I said before, these are areas where this information has been thoroughly reviewed. It's based on good factual information and it allows them to get more information, not just from the app, but it can take them to outside sources to learn more. You can also show them from the doc. This is where those videos are from pediatricians in Ohio. And it's they're talking about vaccines and they're answering some of those myths, you know, um, and ba backing that up with factual information. So if they're interested, there are those videos available as well. So if you have any further questions on the screen here, you can see um, Dr. Gittleman's uh, email as well as my email. Um, please feel free to reach out to us with any questions or, or concerns that you may have. And then don't forget, 
uh, to click the link below to complete your post test.